Welcome to Conversations, a podcast provided by the Center for Thriving Leaders and sponsored by Grace Theological Seminary. I'm Dr. Trent Lambert, and we are here to help leaders thrive in ministry. Let's jump into the conversation for today. Welcome to Conversations, a podcast provided by the Center for Thriving Leaders and sponsored by Grace Theological Seminary. I'm Dr. Trent Lambert, and we are here to help leaders thrive in ministry. Let's jump right into our conversation for today. And I am so blessed today to have in our podcast studio of Grace College and Seminary, Mark Mitchell. And so I have asked him a few weeks ago if he would join us. And I am so blessed today to have Mark in our studio. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here and excited. Thanks, Mark. Hey, let me tell you a little about Mark for those of that are listening. Mark Mitchell is a highly experienced professional who has dedicated over two decades to the field of therapy. With a deep passion for helping others, understanding human behavior, and living at the highest level of performance, Mark has transitioned his services to include helping, leadership, and performance coaching. Mark is a certified professional coach through the globally recognized Institute for Professional Excellence in Coaching, IPEC. Through his role, Mark assists individuals and companies in achieving optimal performance and creating successful oriented cultures. With a wealth of knowledge and experience, Mark brings a unique perspective to the table, empowering clients to thrive in their personal, spiritual, and professional lives. Mark is the owner of both Mitchell Counseling and KOA Coaching and Consulting. Mark, thanks for carving out of your busy schedule some time to be with us today. I'm excited, man. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. Well, Mark, it's certainly fall here in Indiana, and we're enjoying some of the transition. Leaves are starting to fall. And so um, I'm not sure if you're a football fan or not, but football's in full swing. And as I mentioned to you, I was just, you know, had the ability to coach a team the other night to a championship. So um, it's a good time of year. It's a good time of year and worth celebrating for sure. Hey. Congratulations on the victory. Thank you so much. Um, let's jump right into our conversation for today. And we're dealing with some issues on mental health. And Mark, I have the ability and the blessing to minister to pastors all over the country. And as I travel and talk to pastors, I, I did a poll of what is their greatest need? How can I help them? And one of the resounding responses I get is mental health. Mm. That either they themselves are dealing with some issues and don't know how to get help, or people in their church have some hard-hitting issues that they don't know how to deal with. And so um, this is kind of our meeting today, Mark. And so I'm glad to to kind of proverbially pick your brain, hear your expertise, and help some pastors today. Well, and, and I'm just thrilled to be able to do that. It, I, it is an absolute passion and desire from my, my standpoint to be able to support pastors as well. I grew up uh, actually as a pastor's son. My father was a pastor all my life and actually even till now. So he's been a pastor for over 30 some years uh, and, and uh, grew up in Hawaii. So he was a pastor of a Grace Brethren Church out in Hawaii for uh, a number of those years, a majority of our life, and uh, now pastors of a church here in uh, Indiana as well. So, so how long did you live in Hawaii? I grew up there for the most part. Most of my, so we moved there in 1984. I think I was nine or 10 years old at that point. And uh, I, I, my family has lived there all through my college years. I did go to college at Grace College, uh, so I am a graduate of Grace uh, and their master's program in counseling as well. Um, but uh, so, yeah, it, it's been a, a couple of decades that uh, my family's lived in Hawaii. And, um, but I've been here now, and this reveals a little even of my age to a degree here too. So I've been out here in Indiana for over 20 years now too, so. Well, we'll have our native Hoosiers close their ears at this moment, but um, do you miss Hawaii? I miss Hawaii every day. The culture I miss, the ocean I miss, the surfing. So there is something every day that I'm connected to uh, the culture of Hawaii via either it's the music I'm listening to. Uh, I watch surfing just about every single day of my life. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an enrichment of beauty um, and, and a big part of who I am for sure. I have been to Hawaii, love Hawaii. I have not had my son there, so he's begging me the next trip to take him to Hawaii. It's fantastic. 
Um, let's dive right in today. Sure. And you, you mentioned to us your connection with Hawaii growing up. But how about you just tell me a little about your family, kids, and maybe some hobbies that you have? Sure. Well, so, um, yeah, I've been married to my wife, Jennifer. Uh, we celebrated 21 years last summer. So Congratulations. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, and uh, we have two, two children. Uh, my son, Jordan, is 17 years old, and my daughter, Casey, is 14, close to turning 15. Are you surviving the teenage years? Uh, we're surviving, and that is a good word for it. Uh, there, are, there are definitely times of thriving, but surviving does does uh, characterize something. Amen to that. So, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, it, as far as, um, you know, my wife is also a therapist. We actually met when I was in the master's program at Grace. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we started a private practice together and had a private mm-hmm. practice for about nine years. Uh, together, and she's now uh, doing some work with a community mental health center here, and I still run the private practice and, and a coaching practice as well. Um, one of the things that we do have a passion in doing together is we do a lot of uh, marriage work. And so um, I'm a Gottman trained therapist, and so I get a lot of referrals uh, to do couples work and to do counseling in, in my private practice. And we together run marriage retreats uh, for. Uh, different churches. Uh, we've run marriage classes for churches before, but that's been a part of our passion and our ministry as well. So, You mentioned that you were a Grace grad. Did you do your undergrad and your master's work here at Grace? I did, yeah. Now, and you take a boy from Hawaii, okay? So uh, uh, I remember uh, distinctly because it came out, and um, when I came out, it, it must have been uh, the second... Uh, uh, it, it was the first experience of winter, and uh, it was a winter storm that year. So it hit wind chill factors. So you're from Hawaii, yeah, and you yeah. come here to Indiana. It's unbelievable. Uh, wind chill factors, negative 60 degree uh, wind chill at moments. And I just remember, how do people live where if you're outside for too long, you just die? Like like you literally just don't live any longer, you know? Uh, but I kind of got over that, uh, and um, I had a great experience at Grace College. Um, uh, I was from Hawaii. I connected a lot with some other guys from California, some other people who had surfing as part of their passion, and uh, we had a musical passion together. And so I was fortunate enough to have a great group of guys that uh, we were able to do uh, uh, lots of ministry work. Um, Even outside of Grace College, we started uh, um, maybe even some if they're listening to this podcast, if they remember, we started Brighter Days, which was a uh, Bible study that we ran out into the community. And then it ran into what we called the Happy Soul Kitchen. So we ran another ministry uh, where we had local bands come and play. Um, and it was just really an outreach to the community. And um, just just some really strong believers with a like mind passion for the community and the passion for people. Um, and so we just had a ton of amazing experiences together. Uh, and some of them are my best friends even to this day. So, yeah, I had a great experience at Grace. Um, you know, I, I try to go back to Hawaii, uh, and, uh, it just, as much as possible, as right? much as possible. Yeah. And I remember, uh, the, the job that I could get, uh, I was a jet ski instructor, uh, for a tourist company after college and, uh, was sitting there thinking, man, I, uh, this is not exactly what you thought you'd be doing. So, so, so you yeah. you were a jet ski instructor in Hawaii yeah, after yeah. college. Yes, a lot of lot of skill and practice needs to be in. Brother, you were living the dream. <laughs> um, but uh, I had a, a wonderful uh, professor that had a good relationship with, um, and uh, he's passed away now. But uh, Dr. Mike Grill uh, was an amazing person to me, an amazing professor, and he, for whatever reason, told some people. Uh, at Bowen Center out here, which is a community mental health center here in, in Warsaw, Indiana, to give me a call, offer me a job. And I got this weird call at three in the morning because they didn't know their time difference. And they offered me a job. And I thought, you know, I, I will explore this for a couple years. If I like it, I'll get my master's degree. If I don't, back to Hawaii, I'll, I'll paint, I'll work construction, and I'll surf raise a family, that's going to be it. And uh, to condense a very, very long story to that, um, I did find a passion for working with others and then proceeded to get my master's degree 
uh, through Grace College as well. And uh, not only did I get a master's degree, but I also found the person I'm spending the rest of my life with. So there's a lot of a lot of benefit. Praise God for yeah. that. So so you got your master's, mm-hmm. found a career, found your wife, yeah. and now you float on Wainano Lake on your surfboard. <laughs> I have. I have done it before. Uh, and floating is the accurate word. Yes. <laughs> How did you hear about Grace College and Seminary? Well, so my father was a Grace Brethren pastor. And uh, I was, for a very short time, I was born here, okay, uh, while my father was finishing up seminary. So technically, I've returned to the place that that, uh, that I was born. Uh, but that was my connection to Grace College. And uh, I had some other friends that were going to go. Um, I didn't have a lot of particular direction after high school and those elements and, and just thought, you know what, let's try it out. They all came back and stayed in Hawaii and I couldn't get enough good enough excuse to drop out of college. So I, uh, I, I finished out and my path went this way. Well, we're so glad you did. Yeah, me too. Mark, let's dive right in and give some pastors and some leaders some help today. Yes. Um, what are some key areas that pastors need to be aware of when counseling people today? It's such a great question. Um, and I'm going to put it in a little bit of context, really in some of the same things that I have to consider uh, in, in counseling people as well. And um, I kind of looked, I was looking to see if pastors have a particular ethical board, right? Because in, in the in the therapy world, in the counseling world, we are bound by ethical guidelines and ethical boards that help kind of guide that element of, of what we need and how to equip and what we need to do for counseling. Um, and I don't know that pastors have the same type of resources in, in that regards. And so I think what you're asking is a really important question. And so part of that is examining what are the ethics that we do consider when counseling people? And so when I think of ethics, like I think of issues like confidentiality. What, what as a church is our stance on confidentiality, privacy for people that come and, and see me for, you know, for counsel or for, you know, for counseling in those terms, right? Um, I think another thing that is crucial for therapists, which I think is also very crucial for pastors, is understanding boundaries. And that is one area that I find that pastors have a lot of difficulty because here's the, the, the body, it's like a family to some degree here, right? And you're serving together, you're ministering together, you're, 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 you're having cookouts together, you know, you're having family events together, and then now you're also at times their counselor, right? And so um, I think that for pastors, one thing in considering that role, I, you know, even watching my father over all the years, it can be a very lonely position, be a very lonely bis- position at times because you are seen as the authority in things or you are seen in, in a lot of areas. Uh, and so I think it's important to have an understanding of what do those boundaries look like with the people that I'm counseling. And that will also tap into when we talk about referral a little bit more later too. So that's another area to kind of consider um, when counseling people, understanding maybe some of the basic skills of what it is to, to listen, uh, active listening, what is empathy, how to use empathy in, in the correct ways. You know, how do we create safety in the way that people are coming and talking to us? Um, are, again, some, those are some elements that I think pastors would want to consider when, when counseling other people. Um, cultural elements, cultural sensitivity. Uh, that is another area, I think, where it can be very difficult to understand all the nuances of people's culture and where they're coming in at. Uh, and that, and that, and when we look at the cultural components of even of where we're coming at from day, some people are believers, some people are not believers that are coming to pastors, right? So even understanding those dynamics and their cultural dynamics, what are their beliefs, what are they holding to, um, and not about compromising but really just having a deep understanding or a sensitivity to maybe where people are coming in at, where their backgrounds are coming from. You know, economic aspects create culture, right? Uh, past trauma can create culture. You know, so many elements uh, that people are bringing into even that counseling session. You know, this brings up a dynamic that is um, somewhat combative 
somewhat divisive and not agreed upon in every camp. That for many years as a pastor, I was a senior pastor for over 20 years, I would have people come to my office, I would give them biblical advice, I would pray with them, give them scripture, they would leave my office, and inside I'm thinking, I didn't really help them. Mm. I gave them scripture, prayed with them, God's going to answer, yes. It wasn't until, Mark, years later as a pastor that I was dealing with some issues. Pastors deal with issues too. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, as pastors, we always have the Superman cape on. Yeah. We can't show ourselves vulnerable. And um, I, I went to some pastoral friends to seek some help and some guidance, and I got the same thing. Prayed for me, gave me some biblical verses, um, but I left. I wasn't helped. And it wasn't until I went and I saw a Christian counselor and I really got some help for some of the issues that I was battling with some of our, our church situations. So there's some different beliefs, and I'd love to know your your stance on this. And here at Grace College and Seminary, we take a stance on integration mm-hmm. where we teach biblical scripture values, but we also integrate that with psychological tools. Yeah. And so what what is kind of your take on that? Should should pastors use some psychological tools with Scripture? Should they just stick to Scripture? What, what's your take on that? Yeah, so you, you tapped on two really big uh, 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 topics, and let me let me kind of address one, and let me address that in, in the second one. But the the idea of self care for for pastors, and that that uh, lens that so many take that they have to have the Superman cape on, right? That 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 we can't be vulnerable. And and I think, again, that's where it comes back to where I say sometimes the pastorate is is one of the loneliest positions that you have if you're not careful in how we set those things up. So true. And so one of the things that I would want to say for, for pastors in dealing even with the counseling element is how do we surround ourselves with the right support to remove that stigma that we have to have the Superman cape on? Because it's really about the vulnerability it's the ability to be able to share how we are as humans, because we're humans first, <laughs> of what does it look like to to struggle and how do I how do I have those supports in, in, in play, whether it's through other counselors or, you know, a, a good group of other men who you can trust and have that space. You know, now does that mean we share all of our issues with, with the congregation? No, I don't think that that always is going to be appropriate either, you know. But just as much even as a therapist— and this is where a therapist as well as a pastor have a lot in common, is you are taking in a lot of challenging subject matter and taking care of things and dealing with your own. It's not that, hey, our family gets along every day and is perfect and our marriage is wonderful and all of it. You know, no, we're human. We, we're facing a lot of these things. And now we're also having to face all of these with our congregation and take care of them. And so that self-care component is a huge element. So I just wanted to to put that um, and so often overlooked. Oh man, it, it absolutely, absolutely. Like I said, it's probably one of the bigger issues that I would see. And when we struggle in silence, what happens? Well, then we get a lot of shame. We get a lot of things again that pulls us to withdraw from even trying to deal with those issues and, and components and to begin with. And the reality is, pastors are just as much as a human being and just as much as needing care and support as every single person in the in that congregation. And that grows to be so divisive in a marriage. Yeah. And it, it begins to produce, you know, the, the quote unquote pastor kids. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Creates the rigidity. It does. Yes. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Uh, we we'll go to honor versus honesty, uh is a is a is a phrase that I, I've I've heard so much connected to that where it's we have to as long as we have the appearance and we can create the appearance of doing well and but you know so true we're falling apart inside so yeah so true so the other issue you're talking about is the integration and and I love this question because I think that integration is probably the optimal way of doing therapy it's the best place when I have somebody coming into my office and they want to go through it through a lens of faith as well as looking at every other element to what we do, now I feel like it's a holistic way of treating someone. You know, you, their truth is truth, right? And so, and so I think that, um, you know, looking at, I guess if you were to uh, put a word to it, maybe secular 
psychology to some degree, right? And biblical aspects or biblical truth. Truth is still going to be truth. As a Gottman trained therapist, I can train the Gottman method and the seven principles that they came up with, what makes marriage work. I line that up with scripture, support every single component and aspect. In fact, the beauty of that truth is that, man, there's a design for marriage. Well, where did that design come from? That design came and was already there. They just did some of the data that showed, hey, here's some evidence that even shows there's a design. So mirroring those together and presenting it really actually helps us see and understand God's design in a more effective way. Same with using other aspects or other techniques. You know, there's a lot of therapy, counseling, mental health components that are laced and written in Scripture. Dealing with anxiety, dealing with fear, capturing our thoughts. Um, there's all elements that deal with the mental health as well, as well as the spiritual health and emotional health of human beings. So to me, I don't see a separation. Now, where we find those things that get a little bit sketchy is when it breeds into some cultural elements, right? So like if I go to the secular psychology or you know, the American Psychological Association, they're going to have different views on same-sex marriage and they're going to have different views on what gender means and that, and I don't, that, that's not what we're talking about blending. What we're talking about when we're, I think when we look at blending and optimal, it's utilizing all truth because it still points to the same direction. Does that make sense? Well said. Yeah. Absolutely well said. I hope pastors and leaders that are listening, um, this is the price of the podcast right there, what Mark just said. Um, I have said several times that things that I used to counsel people years ago is so much drastically different than some things that are going on today. Mm. And so I know a lot of our listeners, as they're attempting to do some pastoral counseling or encountering some things, you know, what are you seeing in your office? What are some, you know, contemporary problems that you're seeing that people are struggling with? Well, so, so uh, you know, I think in, in depending on sometimes your specialties, so I'm going to get some particulars, right? But I, I can I can speak on it culturally as well in a lot of ways of what we look at in today. And, and again, I worked uh, 17 years in the school system as well. And so you get a real good view generationally of what, what are those components and what do we begin to start to wrestle with. And we're going to see the same issues within the church as we are going to see in, in the community in the world mm-hmm. because we're all, we're all kind of one in this, in this area. Um, one of those big factors, I think marriages are always under attack. The statistics for divorce hasn't really changed, um, you know, uh, and I, in fact, I just did a review on the statistics of divorce, uh, you know, as late as 2021, I think is kind of the, the more later researcher. And it's still ranking up there close to all, half of marriages, uh, first marriages end in divorce. Is that the same in the church as well? Yeah, it's not, it's not a lot of difference. Wow. Uh, and so when I think of the family component, I think of uh, I think what's becoming, I think we're also becoming more aware of mental health. And so we're seeing it because we're, we have more clarity to it. So, you know, uh, in, in fact, how we met together, right? We were, we met together at the trauma conference. Right. And, and I think people's, people are getting a renewed sense and understanding of what trauma is and how trauma affects the life and how trauma affects family, culture, every aspect of it. And I think the more that pastors are in tune with even like, well, how does trauma affect our church? How does trauma affect my own life? Because we all have it to some degree, right? It's just those things that get written, those lenses that we begin to see things through that are that are somewhat broken, you know? And so when we look at that, the, the, you know, a broken lens, I have to wear a Superman cape, right? That's a broken lens. It's there for a reason, right? But I think examining kind of those elements of understanding, like, what are those things that, that uh, really create the narratives that, that people are coming and seeing us? You know, I think, um, you know, addiction is high uh, as usual. And again, you're looking demographically. Some places and some churches are going to experience that heavier than others. Uh, but it's a real significant issue. Uh, pornography addiction, uh, the ease of, you know, the, the material and the access of material that people have now. Uh, that That's typically another big one that we see and, and how that affects culture, how that affects the church, how it affects the men in the church and the women in the church. You know, um, so I think like when what I would encourage pastors to do in dealing with mental health issues 
is deal with mental health issues. Have 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 come have series on what it means to struggle with anxiety. What does it look like with depression? How are we taking care of the men? What does it mean to be good leaders? What does it mean to, you know, what what does it mean to have strong marriages? Are we providing some of that care or having people being able to come in, do some seminars, do some classes, retreats, those elements? And so what I would encourage with with pastors and, and leaders of the church is how do we create programs that help kind of have some series to that or help educate our congregation on it? Because a lot of times others don't know this is where I'm going, what I'm going through as well. Are there any books or um, authors that you would recommend to any of our pastors and leaders that, you know, hey, you know, we, we've studied pastoral counseling. We'd like to take it to another level. You know, we certainly have some different programs here at Grace, and there's some great schools out there that have that. Mm -hmm. Is there anything they could pick up you just, you know, in the meantime, if they could read and maybe get some good resources? Well, I would probably want to put together, I could put together a list that you could attach so that I could get everybody's okay. uh, great. names right, because I, I, I am reading constantly, and I have a stack. Uh, but if, if I was to butcher their, their names and the authors of those names, I wouldn't want to do that to them. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're looking in, in particular area, so if I even look at, uh, in the sexual area, unwanted sexual behavior, the book unwanted by Jay Stringer, probably to me, one of the top by Jay Stringer, Jay Stringer. In fact, if anybody's coming and working on those particular issues for, in my practice, it's a requirement that they actually go through that book. Um, and they have online support, they have online workbooks, but does one of the best ways of understanding all unwanted sexual behavior uh, and through family systems all the way through to the end. Uh, you know, on, on the marriage side of things, you know, I do a lot of study, obviously, with the Gottmans and, and John Gottman's book, uh, Seven Principles that Make Marriage Work. It's phenomenal, fantastic, uh, among so many, many others. I mean, like I said, the, 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 list goes, the list goes on, but I would love to be, I could compile kind of a, a resource. This wonderful, is the best. wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, as we transition here a little bit, um, I want to ask the question, um, and it's kind of based upon, and I'm sure every pastor and leader listening right now has been in this scenario, is we sit down with someone, we start counseling them, we're giving them biblical advice and scripture, um, and we get to that moment where we're thinking, this is above my training. And so what does a pastor, and how does a pastor know when they're counseling someone it's proverbially above their pay grade, and they need to refer that person to someone else and get good professional help. What are some of those signs from your experience that we can encourage some of these pastors? And it's okay. It's okay if you can't solve some of those issues and get them professional help. Well, I'm going to even come to the way that you were kind of phrasing that sentence. If you know, We've all gotten to that space where maybe we're thinking, I don't know what I'm, you know, this seems a little bit more than what I'm able to do. Or, or So one is your instinct in your gut. The moment that you're hitting those places, listen to that. Um, you know, even ethically for me as a therapist, you know, those are things, you know, there are times that I'm going to have to refer someone if I'm not, if I'm not uh, uh, sure that that's an area that I'm able to walk down with them. Just as you're going to a doctor's office, right, and you're going to a general practitioner in some degree, and that general practitioner is saying, hey, I think maybe there's something here. I want you to go see someone else. So the referral basis is a healthy model. It is a healthy way to do that. And I think one thing is for pastors, I think what would help significantly is if they're connected with resources in the community. Having therapists that they know, having having some counselors that they might be able to trust having that right off the bat because those are referrals. Sometimes it's not about I need to stop talking with this person. It might be part of where I'm looking at. Yeah, part of what I think would be beneficial is if you did get some help and and you went down this path with somebody that could take you down a little bit further. Because now we go back to boundaries, right? In in those in those elements of where it really takes a different turn in the therapy session. In a therapy session. The reason that those boundaries are ethical and that we need to have them is because we are really going down in a deep part of someone's life. We might be, you know, uh, going into some of the significant areas of trauma of where things need to be healed. 
um, you know, walking through some very vulnerable moments, and there's a time limit to that. And there's a benefit for there to be a time limit. And where I've seen sometimes the place where it gets really sketchy in ministry is because those boundaries aren't there. And sometimes if I'm dealing with someone that's really struggling with mental illness, they don't have healthy boundaries either. So they're going to take every bit of that. Uh, and so if you're starting to even find that element of feeling like fatigued, uh, I don't know if I really want to work with this person, I don't, uh, or you, you're feeling kind of a sense of dread, oh, this person is coming into my office, or, or I, that's an, oh, yeah. Yeah, another good place for referral. Like, you know, that's a good indication that there needs to maybe be some some other elements in getting this person the support that they need. Um, I think when you 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 mentioned something earlier in the podcast too that I thought was really a great insight. Um, and sometimes we feel, man, is it is it helping this person? I'm not seeing any changes happening in their life. What's really going on? in this situation, another good indication that maybe there's extra support and maybe there's something deeper that they are needing to be able to unpack and, and it would be wise to pass that along, you know? So I think when those issues get incredibly deep that are moving beyond, you know, the idea of what it means to serve together, to minister together, to be a, a family system together, right? Those are the things, what keeps that lane and what keeps those boundaries in it safe for us to do church and to be a pastor and to lead my flock? Because if I don't refer and I go into this other realm, right, it's harder for me to lead, you know? Um, and so we, we find, you know, so I think those are some, those are some elements to, to consider as we look at that. Um, I think anytime, and this is another area where I think you're dealing with issues of self-harm, you're dealing with suicidal thinking, suicidal thoughts, ideations, you know, wanting to hurt other people. You know, uh, those are things that are immediate. How do we get that immediate support in play and get them the help that they need? And that's where, again, find those community resources that, that uh, you know, that there might need to be evaluations. And that's where now it's no longer about counsel. It moves into how do we care for the flock? How do I get this person the right support and the right help? Who can walk alongside them? How do we get them to where they need to be? That's going to keep a very clear and a healthy boundary for any minister in, the, in that place as well. Mark, you just mentioned the suicidal situation. Mm. Um, let's say one of our pastors who's listening has a situation like that. What should they do? Well, that's where we need to, that anytime that someone is, is having those thoughts or ideations, we want that to be evaluated by someone who's professional. And so that's, and also secure the way that that person has support. Is there a family member that can be reached out right now? Is there someone in the community that is able to walk alongside them? Or do we need to be able to take them? Can, can we, you know, and again, is there people that can come along with us that we don't have to operate alone? Uh, I was a crisis management uh, instructor for a number of years. And one of the things that create the most fear, right, is we don't know what to do. We don't have a plan. And so without the plan, now we're reacting. We're just reacting situ situations. And if I feel overwhelmed, sometimes it's like, okay, well, you know, we'll pray for you. You're going to be okay. And, you know, don't worry. You know, uh, uh, part of it is because we just don't have a plan in play in so what true. to do, right? And so as a church, that's where I would say have that guidelines. Here's what we would do in this situation. Here's who we can call. Here's the resources and supports in the community. So when that situation takes place, okay, not if. <laughs> I'd imagine there's a lot of pastors that know exactly what I'm talking about right now. Yes, they okay? do. And so when that takes place, having that plan and having those supports, you know, in play, that is that is such a vital part in in being able to care correctly, you know. And I think the other element uh, that we can't forget on that is abuse, right? Uh, um, how often, you know, has the church, you know, had some some real hurt, even in you know, in some of the community, how they look at how they hide abuse, or they don't they don't reveal these things, and they don't they don't share these things. And and again, I think, um, you know, that's another area of we want to have protocol. 
because you are going to deal with sexual abuse in your church, in your congregation. How do we protect those things? And how do we report that? How do we get that information and all the, the safeguard? What we want to, and again, it's about protecting the flock, right? And so as leaders and as pastors, you want to have those plans in play. You want to have those supports. That's leading well. That's leading well. And we want to create a place that's safe. Safe. It's safe to be a sinner. It's safe to be a saint. It's safe to know Jesus. It's safe that we know our kids are going to be protected. It's safe that, you know, that, man, we're looking out for their, those kids that are on the fringe and aren't doing well, that we want to pull them in. You know, the good leadership is going to look at how do we create those safeguards. And the more that we put some plan and have talks and discussions, you can't, you can't minimize collaboration enough. Like collaboration is significant. How do we collaborate with our team members? How do we pull in people who are professionals that could help us write those guidelines out, come up with those plans? So so pastors that are listening right now, let's say they're thinking, you know what, I, I need to do this. Um, what do you recommend to them? Do they do they Google search? How, how do they find those resources in their communities? Well, a lot of times you can even possibly look in within your own congregation. Uh, a lot of times that there's, there's, there's connections there or there's people that would know. Um, not everybody has that, right? And there's going to be smaller churches and there's going to be, there's, there's all sorts of different demographics that, that can make that challenging, but you could do that, right? So even if you were to go to, uh, you know, a nationally known website, go to psychology today, uh, and you can type in Christian counselors in your area, mm -hmm. pull, pull up a whole list of anybody who is registered on that site, which quite a few of the therapists are registered on those sites. And so you'll find a brief description of those. And in most places that I would know, I know if any pastor was to ever call and just say, hey, could you tell me a little bit about what you do and, and, and what, what, what ways you can, you know, you support or what's your, uh, you know, what's your view, what's your theology on things? I, I think those are all things that most places and people would uh, be willing to have a conversation and talk with. The other thing is training. Training and those things are available for pastors too. So even if you look at uh, you know programs like Prepare and Enrich, you know great premarital program for pastors who I, you know most pastors are doing premarital counseling. Mm -hmm. You know what kind of programs do we have? What kind of training do we have in that? You know, um, you know churches use you know other care ministries. You know, there's Stephen Ministries is a big one in this area. I know a couple of different churches that do that, and mm -hmm. those organizations. Um, are bigger organizations that go through training. You go through certification to some degree, I believe, on on that. Uh, and so, yeah, those things can be found online and, and a lot of resources there and, and support that can be in your area. Excellent. As we kind of wrap up today, I have to ask you, have you seen anything different in culture when it comes to mental health trauma post-COVID? Um, have you seen anything kind of rise, change, you know, vacillate in any way with a culture being post-COVID now? A hundred percent on on a lot of different areas. And I would um, so one is we're dealing with high levels of grief and loss. There's people who have lost a lot of their family members. Um, you know, so I mean, there's elements there that have really changed the whole roadmap of of their families, right? But one thing that I think stands out significant, or actually, man, there's, there's so much more than one. Um, but if I, if I look at the lack of community, you know, post-COVID, because what happened was everyone got isolated. Everyone kind of, and, and you condition yourself to that. So when I, when I was looking at kind of the return to, to church, I'd imagine that there's a lot of pastors out there that could say, wow, man, we, it took a real hit, took a, you know, a lot of Correct. people aren't coming back or now we're just watching it online and Correct. gotten used to watching it online. And so it kind of takes away a sense of community and connection. And I think that that is an absolute essential component to the health of a church is how well do we have community? How well do we have connection and are people feeling like, man, this is a place that I belong. And so I see that that has taken a little bit of a hit after COVID. 
But then if we also look at where did the culture go, culture went to a place of fear, went to a place of anxiety, right? Uh, you know, uh, how much was it pumped out, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, do this or you're, or this horrible thing is going to happen to you here, or you should, you know, like it was just an absolute culture of fear and anxiety and division. We found a lot of division through that aspect, even whether people view the, the vaccination or, or not to be vaccinated, like it just became an absolute uh, device of time. And so I think culturally, when you're talking about post-COVID, there are definitely going to be some of those cultural elements that are in play. The lack of connection, high levels of anxiety, uh, you know, the increase of anxiety disorders, uh, uh, and even for, for kids, uh, you know, depression and anxiety is absolutely huge now. And a lot of those things have increased since COVID because of the lack of community disconnection. Um, you know, there's a lot of components that can play into that. But yeah, I have seen that's where it's coming through my office pretty significant. Finally. Yes. We have, again, pastors, ministry leaders listening to us. Um, what are some last, maybe it's a point or a couple pointers um, that you could leave our listeners with when it comes to our topic of trauma, mental health. Um, what's some lasting words you could leave with them? Mm. On trauma and mental health and just just in that role of, of being a pastor and, and a true leader and a shepherd, um, I'm going to go with relationship and safety. When we look at some of the biggest elements of how do we show Christ? How do we show, you know, the love? How do we show uh, true salvation? Who we've been made to be is going to come from that place of relationship and safety and the lack of judgment. I think that those are some of the most significant because when we think about trauma, it creates these lenses from how we see yourself. Mm -hmm. Right, we we lose this sense of true purpose and meaning and connection to to life in a, in a really meaningful way because of sometimes the events that have happened in our life, the things that that continue to shape us. And so, the more that as pastors are taking care of their own mental health, okay, I can't stress that enough. Okay, the more pastors are are willing to do that care for themselves, that clarity and awareness only helps you love and serve your congregation in a more significant and powerful way because you will understand it to a different level and a different significance. And so I think when I think of when I think of how we want to show people Christ and show people his love, show people that his design for things, right? And when we're outside of the design is profoundly painful, okay? So when we want to show them the hope of that design, it's going to be coming through that place of safety and coming through relationship and uh, helping them overcome those lenses that we've developed over those years. Mark, some great insights and help for our listeners today. Um, if our listeners have want some more information and more information about you and your, your practice, how can they get a hold of you? Well, yeah, so um, my... My uh, counseling practice is Mitchell Counseling and Consulting, uh, and it's mitchell-counseling.com is, is, is a link to getting to the counseling component. Um, the other venture that I've opened up doesn't have the website yet, but COA Coaching and Consulting uh, is my new venture and my new passion. And through that le level and in some of the services that I'm even providing through the coaching element, um, is working even right, right now, having some of those conversations with churches and pastors about how do we develop a culture that actually embraces mental health in an empowering way, Excellent. and how do we create programs. And so I'm really excited about some of the possibilities that are coming up there too. Um, and so that email is coa.lifeandleadership at gmail.com. And uh, the number to reach me is 574-529-1042. I'm able to be reached that way as well. Um, but would be happy to talk about, uh, you know, supporting others and, and, and creating resources. Um, in the des description of this podcast, I'm going to just kind of attach a, 
a pastoral referral guideline uh, that people can have and talk with their leadership. They can look at those things and say, how do we create a plan? And just kind of give some of those topics and some areas for us to be able to talk through a little bit. And so they would be able to have access to that as well. Um, and I just, yeah, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So, And pastors, uh, take advantage of um, this worksheet that Mark has prepared of creating a plan um, for your counseling and, and therapy department in your church. Be a great asset for you. Mark, thanks for joining us today in the Grace College and Seminary podcast studio. Thank you. Absolutely. It's a blast. I loved it. This is Dr. Trent Lambert with the Center for Thriving Leaders in Grace Theological Seminary, challenging you to keep thriving in ministry. Thanks for joining us. Talk to you next time. This is Dr. Trent Lambert with the Center for Thriving Leaders in Grace Theological Seminary, challenging you to keep thriving in ministry. Thanks for joining us today.